Conrad Steiner. I'm a doctor of medicine. Tonight's story has the title, My Child's Keeper. Guardian of birth, healer of the sick, comforter of the aged. To the profession of medicine, to the men and women who labor in its cause, this story is dedicated. The object in point, a teddy bear. The cases in point, two children. From birth, both were among the world's fortunate children. They were blessed with good health, born to parents who welcomed them, loved them, gave them every protection and care. Every protection except for a few careless moments. But it was time enough to wipe out all the benefits that God and loving parents can bestow. The first case in point, Daniel Gardner, Jr., 18 months old. The second case in point, Catherine McClure, aged five years. I think he wants back. <laughs> well, then perhaps you'd better give it to him. I'd rather have Teddy broken than our eardrums. Ellen, I have mean to ask you, do you think Danny could possibly be jealous because the new baby's on its way? Jealous before it's even born? Well, I don't know. I tried to explain it to him yesterday, just like it says in those new child guidance books. He's been acting like a perfect monster ever since. Forget it. He's probably cutting some new teeth. Well, listen, I finally got the sewing machine fixed. Do you want to give me that material for Danny's play suit? Mm -hmm. I can start on it this afternoon. Wonderful. Listen, it's on the uh, top shelf in the bedroom closet. Oh, I'll get it. Okay. Anywhere. Could it be in the hall closet? I'll be right up. Kathy, I'm going upstairs for a minute. You stay and watch Danny for me, will you? All right, I'll take good care of her. I remembered I put the material in the window seat. Hello? It's Texas. Hello, Dan. Just a minute. Hello? Oh, hello, darling. Oh, that was Ellen. How are you? So am I. Does the field look good? What does the test well show? <coughs> Do you think you'll be much longer than a week, Dan? sheets. Treat the shock first. Take care of the burns later. All right, doctor. Um, 
continue with the oxygen on both children. Let's get a blood count, hematocrit, hemoglobin. Type and cross-match blood for both children. so we can start a plasma unit. We'll calculate the fluid for both children for the next 24 hours. Keep an accurate record of the blood pressure and urinary output. Yes, doctor. Parents got some burns themselves. Better talk to them now. Poor little kids. I understand the mothers were with them in the house when it happened. Then we left them alone for a few minutes. That's all it takes. Just a few minutes. Gil! Oh, no. How's Kathy? And Danny? You don't know yet. Bonnie's down there. Bonnie, did you get hold of Dan? He's out somewhere. They're surveying a new oil field. His office said that they'd try to get him. Where are the kids? In the emergency room. They said Dr. Steiner would be out as soon as they took care of them. How did it happen? Helen, how did it happen? Mr. McClure? Oh, the doctor. How are the kids? Well, it's still a little early to tell. Ms. Gardner, did you get in touch with her husband? He's still in Texas. His office said they try to reach him. I see. How's Danny? I've got to have the truth. I've got to know. Oh, I'm sorry, Miss Gardner. There's nothing definite I can tell you right now. His burns are extensive and severe. But they are going to live. Danny's got to live. He's got to. Danny's condition is very grave. I've taken the liberty of calling another physician, a specialist in consultation. And that's all I can tell you right now. What about Kathy? Well, her burns are less extensive, but both children are in shock. Extreme loss of body fluids. We're also concerned about possible damage to the kidneys. <laughs> We're doing everything possible. I'm sorry I can't be more encouraging. But we'll just have to wait and see how they respond to the initial treatment. How long will that be? Well, we'll be watching them very closely for the next two or three days. If there's any change, we'll let you know. Doctor, you mean we're going to have to wait that long to see if they're going to live? That's right. We have to treat the shock before we can treat the burn. Shock results from fluid depletion of the body's cells. For a third degree burn destroys all layers of the skin, leaving an open, gaping wound through which the body's proteins and fluids slowly seep away. Immediate consultation is held with Dr. Borden, the consulting physician called in on the case. Close check is maintained on the state of hydration of both patients. Frequent tests are made to determine chloride concentration and state of the circulating blood volume. 
According to the loss of weight and extent of burns of each patient, every effort is made to restore the balance of body fluids and electrolytes by transfusions of whole blood and replacement solutions administered both orally and intravenously. to wait. Must be something he can tell us. When I asked him last night, we just went upstairs for a few minutes. I told Kathy to take care of Dad. on his way. The airport's fogged in. He can't get a plane to tonight. Bonnie, I... I know what you're thinking. I know how you feel. Please, Bonnie. Won't you talk to me? There's nothing to talk about. Miss Gardner. There's a telephone call for you at the desk. It's your mother. I do. What can I say? I don't know. What can anybody say? It's done. It's already done. Does Gardner go home? She's at the phone. Well, I've got some good news for you. Kathy's condition has definitely improved. We've overcome the primary dehydration. No complications have shown up yet. She's taking fluids very well and no nausea. And she's going to live. She's going to be all right. And Danny? Well, Dr. Barton's with him now. There's a lot of hard work ahead for Kathy, a lot of discomfort, but apparently she's in no immediate danger. Thank you, doctor. One thing you have to realize, it's going to be a long, hard pull. There are many phases of treatment for Kathy to go through. Will she be badly scarred? Well, you have to remember that she's lost almost 30% of the surface area of her skin. With such an extensive burn, some scarring's inevitable. But in time, it'll become less noticeable. Isn't there something you can do to stop the scarring? Sit down, Mr. Clark. Did either of you ever have a bad burn, bad cut, something that left a scar on me? Yes, I fell off my bike when I was a kid. Mr. McClure, do you remember how this wound healed? How the new skin formed around the edges? And right here in the center, a different kind of tissue formed? You mean scar tissue? That's right. See, to understand how the body goes about repairing a surface wound, you have to realize that skin is made up of various layers of tissue. Let's say this is a cross-section of a piece of skin. On the top, we have the epithelium, below various layers of dermis, and underlying the whole structure, a layer of fatty tissue. Now, if the epithelium and even a major part of the dermis is destroyed, new skin cells can still be formed. They're manufactured by the hair follicles and the sweat glands. If they're not destroyed, the wound heals quickly and without scarring. If they are, if the layers of skin are destroyed down to the fatty tissue or beyond, then we have an entirely different situation. You mean the wound or burn won't heal? Well, eventually it would, if the damage wasn't too extensive. But you must remember that Kathy has lost almost 30% of the surface area of her skin. The new cells can only form around the edges, and they grow very slowly. As the healing proceeds, the wound contracts. It puckers, like this. Only it would be much more pronounced in the case of a large wound like Kathy's. Will she be badly scarred? Ms. McClure, I can't say right now. It looks encouraging. And Danny, too? He'll be all right? Excuse me, Miss Gardner.
Miss Gardner. Doctor, is it true? Danny's going to be all right. Let me help you. It's too late. You can't help now. So small. It was so small. So little. All the suffering. All the pain. All the pain. Don't think about it. Please, Bonnie. Try not to think about it. My baby's dead. He's dead. You don't think about it. Don't think about it. You think about it, Helen. Think about my baby. He's dead. Why is he dead? Kathy, she killed him, nobody else. Kathy killed my baby. He's dead. And he's dead. <laughs> Are you sure you wouldn't like to go home now? I'll be off duty in about 30 minutes. I'd be glad to drive you home if you'd like. I already told you. I have to wait. I have to wait here. Mrs. McClure. Kathy's awake now. You can see her for a few moments if you'd like. Oh, thank you. Did Mr. McClure have to leave? Just for a half hour or so. We'll be staying with Kathy for the next few nights. Just went home to pick up some things. Oh, I see. Would you come this way, please? Did you try to talk to her again, Mrs. McClure? It didn't do any good. Dr. Steiner tried to talk to her, too, but it didn't do any good. She wouldn't listen. He wanted her to go to some friend's house to spend the night. But she just sits there waiting for her husband. It's not all she's waiting for. It was the last thing she said to me. What was that? She said her baby's dead. She said Kathy killed him. Now she's waiting for Kathy to die. Couldn't go home without him. 
I understand. And she's finally asleep. Been restless all evening. Been through quite a lot for a five-year-old. But she's alive. She's still alive. Miss Gardner, I'd like to ask you a question. It's a very important question. It's not important for the child you lost that much has passed. But it is important for the child or children you're going to have in the future. What's your impression of a child? I mean, a five-year-old like Kathy here. I don't understand. You're accusing this girl of being responsible for your baby's death. She's to blame for the whole thing. She is. She did it. Danny'd be alive if it wasn't for her. You're wrong, Mrs. Gardner. You couldn't be more wrong. That's a child lying there in that bed. She thinks like a child. She acts like a child. You can't expect anything more of her. And that's exactly what you're guilty of, demanding adult behavior from a five-year-old child. But she knew better. She's so smart at other things. She knew better than to touch that lighter. No, she didn't, Mrs. Gardner. She didn't know. If she had, she'd never have touched it in the first place. No rational human being ever does anything that will bring harm to himself. There's one thing I'd like to make clear to you. You and Mrs. McClure are modern, educated mothers. You're dedicated to your children. You pride yourselves on the way you raise them. That's fine. It's all well and good. But there's one thing you tend to forget. No matter how advanced your thinking is on the subject of child raising, no matter how intelligent you consider your own child or your neighbor's child, don't ever forget the stage of their development. You're still dealing with a child and a child's mind. They're alive, energetic, curious. They've got a lot to learn. And they expect you to teach them. You understand what I'm trying to say? Ellen's daughter. Ellen should have taught her. It was her fault. I've just got one more thing to say, Mrs. Gardner, and then I'll let you decide who's to blame. Three points. First, who left the children alone? Second, who left that highly inflammable material, the curtains, so close to the baby's playpen? And third, who left that cigarette lighter within easy reach of those children? That's all I have to say, Miss Gardner. The practice of medicine is a relentless battle against the forces of disease and death. The strength and knowledge of the physician should be directed first against these enemies. He should not be required to fight on a second front against stupidity and carelessness. Every death is tragic, but most tragic of all are those which might so easily have been prevented. Medicine can work wonders, but not miracles. Only the proper amount of parental protection and education can defeat childhood's greatest killer. The accident.